Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me at the back there? Yes? Nodding? Good, good, good. Um, I'll try and be brief, because I'd rather do this through questions and answers than uh, a long monologue from me. Um, but as, uh, as just kindly introduced, I uh, sit at the um, table of permanent secretaries uh, in the UK government, which is the Secretary General equivalent, I think, out here. Um, I've always liked the job title of permanent secretary. I think it sort of, you know, makes you one up from a temporary secretary. And, um, and I remember uh, uh, being, doing an exchange visit with some Japanese visitors uh, when I had no Japanese, he had no English, so we were doing things through translators. And um, my translator sort of started to laugh when I was being introduced to my Japanese friend. And I said, why, what, what are you laughing at? And he said, he's just described you as an eternal typist. <laughs> so, uh, so I know my role in life. Um, I, um, I'm noted for taking on uh, hopeless causes, uh, the Football Association job uh, being one. Uh, for all the Man United supporters in the uh, room, I'm also an Arsenal fan who was in the away end at Old Trafford uh, two weeks ago for the 8-2 humiliation. Um, and I think um, being able to take on things that make you uh, unpopular is a necessary part of the job that I now have. Um, we, uh, like uh, every major government around the world, have huge, huge problems to deal with at home. Um, we have financial crises, we have social crises, uh, we have economic and enterprise crises, and it's a huge, huge job uh, that the British government and indeed every other government around the world has to try and turn the situation around. Um, we are trying to play an important part in that role through my team. Uh, I work simultaneously to uh, the Prime Minister and Francis Maud. For those of you that know Francis, he's the Minister for the Cabinet Office in the UK Government, uh, but also through to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, and to Danny Alexander, who's the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. So uh, it's, my job faces both to the to both sides of the centre of government, if you like, to the Prime Minister and uh, uh, and the um, Chancellor. I would say that's a necessary part for success. You need to have uh, your equivalent of Prime Ministers and, and Finance Ministry leads on board with everything you do, otherwise the system will divide and conquer. Um, I think it's also important that you have political leadership in the sense that you need at least one politician who is passionate about the agenda and is prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder with you and all the other people that you work with. Uh, to push through what are inevitably difficult decisions. Uh, and I have that with Francis Maud, who's um, a very interesting man. Uh, another time I could talk more about him. Um, but he glorifies in doing what he regards as the unpopular, unsexy bits of politics, the things that save real money and change things behind the scenes. And he leaves the front-facing uh, stuff to his colleagues. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, focal point. I don't believe we will be able to do the job that we've been asked to do without his leadership. So we've got a lot going for us uh, in that uh, way from political leadership. Um, one thing that I would urge people around Europe not to do uh, is to enter into a climate of uh, criticizing and bashing the public servants uh, that work in the organizations, whether they be central government or wider public sector bodies. In my experience, virtually every public employee uh, goes to work to do a fantastically important job that they care about, they work hard for, um, and they put up with a lot of stuff uh, because, of, because of what they uh, care about. And if you go over the top in terms of criticizing them, as the British press does, uh, in my opinion, with our public sector, it can really damage the climate in which you're trying to introduce change. Uh, so I always make it a point in any public presentation uh, to, uh, to make the point I've just made, but mostly to thank and uh, compliment everybody who's working in the public uh, uh, services around the world because I know they all do a great job. And if there are systems and problems that they work within, it's very rarely due to them as individuals, and, uh, and I always make that point. So if we're operating in a world of, of, of economic and public pressures with political support, uh, and hopefully uh, without bashing the public sectors uh, uh, in the press, uh, public servants in the press. What are we actually trying to do? Um, I suppose it really boils down to, uh, to three things. The first, uh, the nature of my uh, organization's uh, title is efficiency and reform. So the first word is the efficiency word. I'll come back to what I mean by that in a minute. 
Uh, the second is the reform word, making change uh, sustainable and uh, systemic. But the third thing I always say is that credibility begins at home. And if you don't actually make your own backyard uh, work in a reformed way and in an efficient uh, way, nobody will take you seriously. And I make that point because actually when you start on one of these roles, you hoover up bits of government from wherever they might be and put them into one place. Um, you actually have to put quite a lot of effort into bringing that team together, um, changing it, making it more uh, effective, and recruiting new leadership always. And, and, and you don't normally have the luxury of very long to do that in. So when I arrived a year ago, I think I had seven different bits of, the, of government brought together under one machinery of government move. Um, uh, and I make no apology for it. None of the people that were directly reporting to me on day one are still there. Um, I've changed the team completely, um, and, uh, and I have brought them together in a different way, and we operate in a much more, uh, in, in one building, in a flexible resourcing mode, and, um, uh, and, and it has changed the way that we operate, and that is now being talked about uh, by others, and I think that's an important uh, lesson for people who are trying to lead one of these exercises. If you're not good yourselves, nobody will take you seriously. Um, so having put that out of the way, the, uh, let me concentrate the rest on what, what we mean by efficiency, what we mean by reform. Now, I know there is a theological debate about what we mean by efficiency. To my minister, it means about spending less money each year. It's quite simple. He doesn't get into the sort of nitty-gritty and the nuances of this. He, he, he says, I want to see folding money in my hand, uh, you know, being returned from the system. Um, and... We set a public spending uh, review last October in the British government for four years um, that basically took the previous government's expenditure plans, which saw public expenditure of about £700 billion sterling at the start, and the original plan was to increase it to about £780 billion. Um, and the British government basically said, we are not going to increase that £700 billion figure. It's going to be a flat cash uh, settlement for four years. Um, so everybody talks about it as though we are cutting the public sector by 80 billion. In fact, we're not growing it by 80 billion, we're keeping it constant. And, um, and I think that's the, um, the first important uh, message. So um, when we are then trying to say, well, how do we find efficiencies that add up to as much of that 80 billion as we can, um, we have to be realistic and say we're not going to find it all uh, from just trying a bit harder and doing things a bit differently. There are going to be some tough uh, choices and decisions to be made. Um, one area that's inevitable is going to be welfare. I think in almost every government around the world, welfare spending is a huge part. You can't save big chunks of money without tackling the welfare budgets. In the, um, in the UK's case, they've got a number of reforms to welfare coming through, which most people talk about as being linked to a program called Universal Credit. Um, and so that is a huge uh, part of, um, of, of saving the 80 billion. But the rest has to come from, uh, from real efficiencies and doing things differently. And the way I like to think of it is we probably want to get about 20 billion of that 80 out of central government. We want to probably get about 20 billion out of wider public sector. And we probably want to get the rem another 10 billion out of uh, fraud, error, and debt in the, uh, in the payment system. And those are the sort of three big blocks of, of money we're going after. Um, we've started on central government in the first year. We've taken the view that uh, central government is, uh, is, is key. Um, and um, in the first 10 months, uh, we've now had an audited figure published of having saved just shy of four billion pounds sterling. Um, and all, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about where that comes from in a second, but it's, it's four billion that hasn't come from closing hospitals and re, you know, reducing teachers and schools and all those sorts of things. It's been from stuff that's largely invisible uh, to the general public, and, um, and it's shown the art of the possible. We're now setting on a journey to try and increase that to a 20 billion pound per annum figure by the end of the spending review. Um, in the wider public sector, for which for us is places like health, education, the police, and local government, um, they've all got their own financial settlements, but they in turn are having to find uh, efficiency savings. They're all doing it in slightly different ways, um, and already they are quite politically controversial. Our recent uh, troubles in August um, from, the, uh, from the two or three days of rioting 
um, re-invoke re, um, the, the debate about should we be cutting the police numbers at this time and uh, all of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's very um, you know, politically sensitive territory in the wider public sector. Fraud, error, and debt is something that just about everybody unifies around. It's just it's really hard to find it and to deal with it. But in every trade union discussion I have, in every political discussion or journalistic discussion, they go, if only you collected the tax that was due to you, if only you, uh, you know, went after the debts that uh, were paid, whether they be penalty fines in courts or whatever it is, um, that would actually take a lot of the pressure out of the system. And, uh, and so those are important areas. But if I stick just now to the 20 billion and talk about what are the sorts of things we're doing, um, obviously you have to look where does the money get spent. The money largely gets spent in pay and procurement. We know that. Um, we have to deal with those two issues. But there are some totemic issues that you have to get right because people won't take you seriously. And the two that we've picked upon are spend on consultancy and spend on marketing. Um, we have savaged the budgets on both. In fact, the reduction one year on another of consultancy spend is 70%, 70%. -0%. And on marketing, it was just about uh, 80%. So we've basically just stopped doing TV and radio advertising and stopped employing you know, consultants to walk around the Whitehall, uh, and I speak as one, so I can, do, I can say these things. Um, because if you don't do that, nobody takes you seriously on the rest. It, you know, it, it's necessary to do, and we've done it, and people have stopped talking about those issues now. Now they're talking about the real substantial issues, which are how do you, uh, how do you change uh, beyond that. If you're going to change the payroll bill of somewhere like Whitehall, um, you uh, have to do it through reductions in the numbers of people working. Um, we have about half a million civil servants in Britain out of six million public servants. Um, we're already down to about 470,000 people, and that's a year on. And uh, you know that number is falling all the time. There'll be a new uh, figure out uh, shortly. Um, don't know exactly how far that's going to go. Um, but some commentators have talked about you know, 80,000, 90,000 off the, off the peak total. It's already the lowest it's ever been since World War II, but it's got a long way to go. Um, if we're going to reduce the number of people in the system, uh, you have to treat them fairly and well. Um, we had uh, some difficult issues to deal with about uh, redundancies in early retirement programs where the accrued rights were so... Uh, expensive and uh, people would argue favorable to the employee that nobody ever invoked them. So the government came in and put an act of parliament on the table to completely savage those rights and then set about negotiating a position with the union somewhere in the middle, um, which it has now done and actually put those offers to larger numbers of civil servants who've accepted the packages um, and, uh, and it's actually happening relatively painlessly. And for many of the people that I speak to who've taken those packages, they are finding it personally liberating. Um, if they're towards the older end of the spectrum, they're getting their pensions early and finding they can do new things with the younger people who've gone, they're finding they've got a lot of really good experience to take into the workplace with them. So it isn't the, the, the disaster scenario uh, that people painted it in advance. And most of the people who've left have left in good heart and good odor and, um, and, it, and it's working well. It also means you then have to concentrate on the people that are left um, who uh, see a kind of salami slice of cuts being applied to them for every week, every month, every year. So one of the, what we've tried to do is to say, let's get ahead as quickly as possible, make all the, all the reductions in staff that we need to do in, in, in civil service quickly in the first 12 to 18 months so that for the rest of the spending cycle and the rest of the parliament, those staff know that they're part of the future and not worrying about their own jobs. It's analogous to the sort of retail organization taking the jobs out of head office before it starts worrying about what it does in the stores. So a big part of pay re reduction is about getting fewer people. Um, we've had pay freezes. We've had redu reductions in the compensation scheme. But the one that's, co that's most controversial in uh, the UK at the moment is the public sector pensions issue where there has been uh, two uh, major changes. One, to the long-term nature of the pension scheme, turning it from a, uh, a peak final salary scheme into a career average scheme. Um, and the other is to ask employees to contribute more to their, to their pensions along the way. Interestingly, it's the second of those that's more controversial. 
uh, because it's immediate, it's understandable, and people see that from next April their pay packet is going to reduce by X percent as they increase the pensions contributions they have to make. The ethereal what their pension might be issue is a little bit harder for them to worry about. Um, but in either case, the trade union movement have made a lot of capital uh, with, the, uh, with the public sector workers on pensions. We've already had one round of strikes just before the summer break. Uh, I'm fully predicting we'll get m many more this autumn, particularly as the weather turns. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, we're expecting big days of industrial action in November, uh, probably coordinated across all public sector workforces. So it's a controversial, it's probably the most controversial thing we're doing of all of the uh, uh, reforms around downsizing the people. On the procurement side, I think what we've done is, is, uh, is straightforward. Um, we've taken a view that if government is buying things that you might classify as commodities, uh, the usual people quote are paper clips, but I prefer to talk about things like energy pro uh, and utility bills. Um, these are things that we're aggregating at the centre of government, doing once on behalf of all of the uh, Whitehall system. And we have a programme now that is agreed with all of the Whitehall departments to increasingly move their commodity spending across 10 commodities to the central buying arm, which in turn we're doing uh, some very innovative and good deals with the supply market in order to, uh, to get the, the, the savings. At the other end of the spectrum, we're taking the bigger and more complex end of procurements and taking a different approach to how we negotiate with our suppliers. Um, uh, many of our suppliers work for multiple government departments, and they're brilliant at dividing and conquering and doing different things in different departments. We've taken a holistic view of how we deal with a company um, and uh, you know, pick British Telecom because they're the one company that everybody uses. You know, we now have a single person facing BT on behalf of the British government. Um, and, uh, and, and, and dealing with all of the issues that all of the Whitehall uh, machine uh, is having with those suppliers. And we're finding that we're getting um, much better and stronger leverage deals with those suppliers. But interestingly, the people that are doing that are not sitting in the center of my team. They're actually the departmental commercial directors who we've said, if you're the commercial director of the Home Office, you're a strong commercial director in your own right. We would like you to operate on behalf of the whole of government as well as on behalf of the Home Office. And so we've anointed them with, with kind of crown level representation and they can deal with certain companies as the whole of government as well as uh, for their department, which is giving them personal job satisfaction. It's also getting them into the whole of government agenda and breaking down the traditional barony resistance to doing things in a coordinated way. So those are the... Um, the big changes that we made there. The change to suppliers, we called them all in the top 20 suppliers. Uh, they had an annual budget of about 8 billion between them. Uh, we said we want 10% off the price now for no different service and no different contractual terms. And we got it. You know, first year, 800 million savings um, just by a coordinated approach to negotiating with suppliers. So these things begin to bear fruit very quickly um, and uh, you can get some real savings. Having sort of talked about the savings side and there's more we could go into, what are the reform areas? Because I know that if I took all those sort of approaches and just let them uh, uh, sort of go lax for a minute, behavior would reverse and we'd be back to uh, the same old uh, uh, stuff as we had when we went in. So what are we trying to do uh, to change the way the system works at large? Well, one thing we're doing is we're constituting uh, new style boards of Whitehall departments um, with a very powerful set of non-executive directors going on from the private sector. Uh, this was coordinated by Lord Brown, John Brown, who used to, uh, as you will remember, run BP. Um, and uh, John is both the uh, lead non-exec director of the Cabinet Office, my bit of government, uh, but he's also the lead non-executive director across the whole of Whitehall, and he has created a team uh, of uh, four non-exec directors to every Whitehall department drawn from the biggest bits of British business, British public service, and British voluntary service. Those boards are absolutely crucial to getting systemic change in uh, because uh, otherwise I think the Whitehall machine will fragment when we, uh, when we, when we relax on it. Secondly, we're looking at civil service reform. 
this is an agenda that is a long-term one, and I, and I think one of the things I find about the British Civil Service is it is already a very highly capable, professional and experienced uh, civil service. I was telling somebody this morning that um, uh, one of the people who I met in the early 90s was a lady by the name of Ursula Brennan, who was a bright young policy sort of star in the traditional Whitehall sense, but took the view 20 years ago that her career would be unfulfilled if all she did was policy in the centre. And she took herself off to go and do large IT projects and large uh, operational management projects in the north of England, as it happened. Um, and that's where I first met her. Um, fast forward 20 years, she's now one of our permanent secretaries. Um, she's running the MOD. Um, so the idea of a woman running the MOD is something that a lot of people find interesting. Uh, I find it actually massively reassuring, and for the first time I'm absolutely confident that the MOD now has uh, you know, highly capable professional leadership at the top because her background has prepared her to do such a job by taking herself off into policy, operational and corporate roles in the public sector. So we have uh, you know, some good examples of that. We're also fortunate that we have a diversity um, uh, success in our British Civil Service, half of the permanent secretaries are women, um, and I think now a third uh, of the next, uh, sorry, 40% um, of the whole of the senior civil service is now women as well. So we're building a pipeline of really strong uh, female leadership and other, in other diversity ways as well. So we've got a lot going for us already, but there is a lot more that we need. Um, I don't buy the argument that you just parachute a whole load of people in from the private sector and just watch it all come right. Many people from the private sector who've gone into the public sector struggle um, with the way it operates, with the complexity of it all, um, and the fact that they're not, you know, the thing doesn't operate as it always does, say, in a very command and control private sector organisation. So it's, it's a simplistic answer to do that. But it is an important part to get a, a breadth of skills in. And what we have found successful in the past is bringing people in, perhaps on a sideways move from their job in the private sector, letting them become familiar with the environment in the public sector, and then they're ready to take on uh, the next stage of leadership. I know I could not do any of the jobs I've done in the last two or three uh, cycles if I hadn't done that myself by coming across in a sideways position um, from the private sector. I think it's a, it's a good model uh, for how people... It takes time, but it is you get better results from it. So I think that's... Uh, important, and I'm, uh, and I'm learning from that. Going forward on civil service reform, I think we're looking quite radically at lots of different ideas, uh, one of which is, uh, is, is looking at whether or not uh, we can uh, significantly co-locate chunks of the uh, central Whitehall machine um, so that departments are actually sharing the same buildings. That tends to break down barriers between civil servants. We have moved my bit of the Cabinet Office into the building that is known as the Treasury Building for precisely that purpose, and that already is enabling the centre of government to join forces in a way that perhaps it hadn't before. Um, we're also looking at new IT tools to try to give people flexibility in working across civil service boundaries, um, and you're probably, uh, like me, familiar with the situation where you move department and suddenly your technology stops working or, uh, and you come from usable technology in your private life to government technology which is riddled with security overlays so you can't actually uh, achieve anything with it. It becomes a very frustrating way of, of collaborating with colleagues. We're trying to enable ways in which we can break the boundaries across departments down in that way. We're also looking at putting other areas out uh, into the uh, uh, wider space, so looking at whether more policy advice should be more contestable rather than solely the province of the public sector civil servant, actually getting the civil service to manage uh, a, a more plural uh, set of policy advice from think tanks and, and, and the like. So lots of ideas going on, um, but I wouldn't pretend... Uh, we've, we've set the direction out yet on that, and probably the next three months we will, and then it'll be easier to talk to you more firmly about what that program is. So those are some of the sort of reforms we're doing uh, at home. Um, I think in the, uh, the wider world, probably the most interesting reform we're doing is for looking at whether the delivery of public services, which has traditionally been either a state-run body um, or a wholly private sector body, whether there is some hybrid model um, that might enable us to get the best of both worlds. And the 
model that the government has picked on is the so-called mutuals model, where we're looking to take a piece of the pu public sector um, today and say, if we put that in as a private entity and gave it a three-way ownership structure, part owned by the government, part owned by some private sector partner, which might be a venture capitalist or it might be a, uh, somebody with an actual uh, specific asset to bring to bear, and crucially, part owned by the staff, um, then do you create an entity that is both that has the best of both public and private? Um, it's what our government believes in very strongly. Um, they look to well-known models in Britain to sort of uh, use for examples of which the most famous is the John Lewis retail chain. Um, and, um, and everybody knows that it's their favorite shop and it's growing and it's very successful and all that, so therefore they think it must be a good thing. And, um, and so we're trying it out. And we have some quite small-scale examples in places like you know, small bits of health and so on. But probably the biggest entity we're trying it with is the civil service pensions administration function, which is currently done by 500 civil servants on behalf of the one and a half million members of current and previous civil servants for their own individual pensions. And we're looking at creating an entity which is, uh, you know, roughly a third, third, third owned by the three entities playing different games on that ownership model, uh, but where no one group has the dominant ownership model and where you give the entity an initial contract to get it going, but then you treat it as just like any other supplier that you might have. So interesting um, uh, new model. If it's successful, it could be as radical as privatization was in the 80s. If it's unsuccessful, I won't ever mention it in any of my speeches in the future and pretend it never happened. But, but it is something quite new and innovative. And then finally, um, in reform, uh, reform is then the front line of the public services. This is not primarily where I would argue that me and my team are leading, um, but we are trying to enable it. So, for example, there are big reforms going on to try to provide more public services digitally um, so that you don't have to, uh, a bit like the airline industry has reinvented itself around the web, uh, a lot of public service moves to do the same. Um, we, we, my team owns the government digital service, which is both doing some of that and enabling some of that, and we've just hired one of the Britain's best digital uh, entrepreneurs to come and lead that, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> we're also helping in areas uh, like the education reforms, where the, the uh, uh, free schools are the particular reform that this government has uh, chosen, freeing schools up from local authority and other uh, control, but still being publicly funded. Um, obviously, that's primarily a role for the education department, but we're supporting it in ways like finding, uh, when new free schools want to come up, we're finding bits of the public sector property estate that they can uh, inhabit, which takes a lot of the lead time uh, out of setting these schools up. And we've just had a, uh, a, an example of that happening in the city of Bristol. So those sorts of areas we're supporting. We're also supporting the reforms like the Universal Credit Programme in welfare, because, as we all know, these things are quite easy. You know, they're quite hard to do at the policy level, but by comparison, they're a lot easier than to implement uh, because the complexity of the technology and the change management of the organisations that deliver welfare uh, are huge, and that's an area where we are playing uh, quite a critical role in helping the Department of Work and Pensions uh, succeed. And I could go on into the you know, other reform areas, the justice area where... Uh, there's a, a much greater use uh, proposed of the voluntary sector in the rehabilitation of offenders. Again, my team's responsible for the policies and the arrangements uh, with big chunks of the voluntary sector and the so-called big society agenda. And we've introduced new financing models like social impact bonds to enable to en encourage and attract new finance uh, to, to areas of traditional social and public service. So there's a huge amount going on on a quite a broad waterfront I come back to the, what I said at the beginning, however. Um, you know, there's really three key messages. The efficiency measure about saving money and doing it in, and then establishing an environment in which it's sustainable uh, is crucial. The reform agenda about ensuring that people feel that they're getting a better service uh, for what they would regard as less money. Uh, and also making sure that you change yourself so that you are credible with the right leadership and the right operating model at home. Um, I leave uh, just with, with, the, um, with the two sort of slogans that I try and push around the place. For many years, government's been talking about more for less. 
the less now is so dramatic. In our administrative budgets, we're reducing by 30%. You cannot sit there credibly in front of staff. And so we're reducing budgets by 30%. We want you to do even more than you did before. Um, we changed that to better for less. Now, I know it's a word change, but the important thing is you start to open up. What does better mean? Better can often mean not doing it at all. Um, vacating that space and allowing other people to fill that space. Better can mean a good enough service, not a gold-plated service, etc. Sometimes better means radically reinventing it and just doing it in a fundamentally different way. So we're putting the focus on the better rather than the more, and that's, uh, that's the agenda. And the, uh, the final thing people say to me is, well, I understand all this, but how can we save money when we have to invest up front to get the savings, the so-called spend-to-save uh, business case? Uh, my colleagues in the British Treasury would say they've seen an awful lot of spending over the years and not much saving, so that sort of case gets very short shrift. So we've kind of inverted it and said, do what you do at home, you save to spend. Um, you know, if you want to go on a nice holiday, you save up during the year and then you go on holiday. Um, and, um, and that's the kind of mindset we're trying to get people in. So if your budget is reducing 10% year on year, which most of them are, reduce it by 12% year on year and reinvest the remaining two. Um, that's what I've done in my own backyard. And, um, and it's, we've gone way below our cost curve initially to come back up again with new investments and new people, new technology and so on and still live within our affordable um, uh, budget line. So those are the two mantras we're preaching. It's better for less, it's safe to spend, and if we do all of that, then uh, hopefully uh, we will come through this uh, dreadful economic cycle with a more sustainable set of public finances, but importantly, a better set of public services to go with it. So that's my message. I hope that's um, reasonably uh, clear and across the board. There will be probably loads of detailed questions, some of which <coughs> there will be massive similarities between particularly Britain and Ireland or other countries in Europe, and some of them there will be very many differences. So can I throw it open now uh, to questions and answers? Thank you very much. <laughs>